and Tom, thank you very much. Um, as Tom said, I'm from Renologic. I know a lot of people um, in the room have worked with us, but there are also a number of new people that have not. So what I'd like to do today is just give you a very brief overview of our services and what we do. And then um, I'd really like to get to the results, and just to keep myself on track here, um, I'd really like to get to talking about some of our results. Um, but first, just a few fast facts. Um, chronic kidney disease is a growing problem in our country, as probably everybody knows. But some really quick statistics, one in nine people in the US have chronic kidney disease. Even more frightening, um, of the people that are in 30, the ages of 30 to 50, 50% of those people will develop chronic kidney disease. So we are talking about half of that population. Now the question is, why is that important? Because as you know, if it's left untreated, chronic kidney disease often turns into end-stage renal disease and dialysis. And if anybody here has had a dialysis claim, they know what that's like. We're seeing on average about $900,000 a year for one dialysis patient, full build charges. Um, and even with you know, standard provider discounts, you're only looking at probably a yeah, 30, 40% discount. Um, the other thing that's um, I think really critical is dialysis is usually in the top five catastrophic claims categories, as most of the stop loss providers here can tell you. But of the top five, it's typically the only one that is both predictable and pre preventable. And that's really where we come in. So, um, Renologic's approach to kidney disease is both comprehensive and proactive. So there's really three elements. One is predict, one is prevent, and then of course the last is cost contain. And um, in order to predict, uh, we use claims data. We do a full analysis. Um, we'll work with employer groups to do a full risk picture of their employees to understand who is at risk for chronic kidney disease, and we even identify those who uh, may not have a diagnosis, but probably do have chronic kidney disease. Once that risk picture is in place, we do have a chronic kidney disease management program. What we do is work with members to help them to understand how to safeguard their kidney health, um, how to um, improve their kidney health if they're on that um, lower range of, of chronic kidney disease, and also how to get them healthy in general to avoid a lot of the other costs associated with chronic kidney disease. And lastly, we do uh, cost containment. And this is a program where we can work with um, employer groups and plans to reduce the cost of dialysis by about 85 to 90 percent. Um, off of full build charges again. And um, again, I can explain in more detail. We have a table up there, and I'll explain how our carve out works. I'm sure a lot of your uh, Cyprus um, representatives have probably talked to you about this. But um, again, it's a very comprehensive approach, but also a predictive approach. So as far as results go, so we've been working with Cyprus for many years on the cost containment side and for about two years on the chronic kidney disease side. And we've had some amazing results. So I'd just like to share some with you. So first of all, um, cost containment savings. Now these are for the last two years, full years. So 2015, 2016. For Cyprus plans alone, we've saved in dialysis costs over $4.9 million which is pretty significant if you talk to some of the folks in the room. Um, as far as our chronic kidney disease program goes, we've had some great results. First of all, for any of um, our plans who have had members participating, and we have about nine employer groups we've been working with so far, we have not had one member that participates in the plan that has gone into the emergency room. Because again, our nurses work with them, and, and what we heard yesterday, so much of emergency room visits are fear and lack of education. And so we really address those issues. Um, zero unplanned inpatient emissions. Of course, you're going to have plans, you're going to have your orthopedics and you know your other things, but as far as people that end up in the emergency room and then with a five-day inpatient stay, none of our members have had that happen. 
Um, and again, and especially no um, emergency room visits that result in urgent dialysis starts, which get very costly. And probably most importantly is not one member that has been participating in our chronic kidney disease program has progressed to dialysis. And this includes members that have been in stage, even late stage five. So, you know, we think that's a pretty significant result. The other thing that we um, like to highlight is our program doesn't just um, reduce the progression to dialysis, it also reduced other medical spend, and we'll talk about that. So the reduction in medical spend in the last 10 years, um, not counting dialysis, but just medical spend, has been over $3 million for these nine plans. We talk a lot about ROI, especially with our chronic kidney disease program, because we believe it's critical that if you're going to participate in a program, you know what you're getting for it. And certainly outcomes are important, but savings is important too. And um, our return on investment for the um, uh, plans that have participated is 11.6 to 1. So they've actually saved 11 times more money than the program has cost them. Um, and why we are different, so there are a lot of disease management programs and there are a lot of cost containment programs out there. And so we just like to talk a little bit about what differentiates us. First of all, because we take such a proactive approach to um, risk identification and risk management, we can work with members who don't even know they have chronic kidney disease, thus stopping them before they get into the very late stages of the disease. Um, our nurses are, work with our members um, very proactively on their schedule, including evenings, weekends. We have bilingual nurses, multilingual nurses. So we try to tailor the program to the needs of the member and not you know, to the needs of our, of our nurses. Um, we do ongoing analysis, so we're always looking for new members, new risk, identifying people that we may not have identified in the beginning. Um, and we also, for those members that are going to progress to dialysis, we make sure and educate them on Medicare Part B, home modalities, all the things that are critical to make sure that they are as successful as possible if they are going to be in dialysis. And lastly, um, our cost containment methodology is unique. I'm not going to go into it here, but I'd love to tell you a little bit about it. And um, I, one of the reasons that Cyprus uses us is because um, it's a very safe and secure way to make sure that the plan is protected from those dialysis costs. Um, benefits, again, um, from a stop loss perspective, a lot of times if you use us, it can help reduce or eliminate lasers. Um, lower spec deductibles, even um, maybe breaks on premiums, so we're happy to talk with you about that. Um, reducing costs, of course, is critical. Um, re keeping people from going into dialysis. But most importantly, members that go on dialysis have a very hard time continuing to stay working. You know, they're often in a dialysis center three days a week. It really impacts their health. So, you know, one of the, the hidden advantages that we maybe don't talk about as much is keeping that member healthy and productive and keeping them part of the workforce. And last, um, I'm not going to really read all these to you. You'll be able to see them, but these are some real world examples of patients, some stories from our nurses that talk about how they've been able to help these members. Real things like people who weren't controlled or weren't even taking insulin because they didn't really need, realize they needed it that badly, but got started. They feel better. People who have lost weight, stopped smoking. There are so many stories because they have kind of a coach, an advocate, somebody who will help them and not just somebody who they see once every three or four months in a doctor's office. So um, it's a comprehensive program. We work with providers. We work with the members. Um, but most of all, it's successful. And so again, we're up there. If you have questions, please come up and, uh, and talk to us. We'll be happy to share any information. How did I do? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's an update. I, this, the chronic kidney disease program that Renalogic has is fabulous. And we see results, and people are, are getting healthier, uh, and employers are saving money. You need to look at that, OK? Uh, talk to Shelly. Talk to Sally, who's up there. Um, talk to your account manager about that as well. The last couple of years at Cypress U, we've talked about reference-based pricing. You remember that? Everyone kind of talks about it, and, and uh, it's the, 
that has continued to evolve and, and change and lots of new things happening on, on that side. Uh, and to, to such an extent now that um, we're calling it value-based payment rather than reference-based pricing uh, for a whole host of reasons that I think Ryan can get into. Um, but I saw some interesting statistics um, you know, with, with respect to what's going on in, in the industry. And first of all, a very large percentage, uh, much larger than ever before, of, of our new clients over the last year have either moved to or um, are, are using a, a value-based payment uh, program. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not unusual, and, and as Kurt Ritter said uh, earlier today, it really is for everyone, and, and you should consider it. Um, there was a study done, though, last year uh, for a large employer who subscribed to a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, and this is why value-based payment is, is um, critical. The, the, the um, study showed that uh, hospitals participating in both Medicare and Blue Cross Blue Shield charged on average 433% of Medicare allowable charges. 433%. Uh, and taking into, con into consideration the, the Blue Cross discount, if you will, uh, they still paid almost 300% of what Medicare would have paid, even though you think you're getting great discounts from Blue Cross Blue Shield. And that's kind of interesting. And there was another study done, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association uh, did charge data from uh, about a million physicians across the country. Interesting results showing that um, Physicians charge on average two and a half times what they accept from Medicare, two and a half times. The states with the biggest offenders, Wisconsin number one, 3.8 times, Alaska 3.7, Oregon 2.9, Massachusetts 2.9, and Iowa 2.8. Any of those states sound familiar to anyone in this room? So you might want to be careful um, when you're starting to make decisions based on, on uh, what your discounts are. Um, that's the theme here. But in any event, we're going to talk to, uh, to Ryan Day, who's going to talk about uh, their value-based program uh, through HST and some of the results that we've been able to incur. So Ryan Day, everybody. Hi everyone, how are you? Uh, we appreciate uh, you guys uh, taking the time to listen to value-based payments, often referred to as reference-based pricing. Uh, it is definitely something that is on the forefront of everybody's mind. We have several clients and brokers uh, that are utilizing us here today uh, that can kind of share their experience, how it's going, and I'll be honest, it's not for everybody. My clients are the ones who want to manage risk. My clients are not the check writers. So they're constantly unasking, what am I getting discounts off of? So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're HST. Uh, we were founded in 2009. Uh, we currently have about 400,000 members uh, doing value-based payments across the country. Uh, we have all shapes and sizes. Uh, I think our largest group's around 50,000 employees and then our smallest being you know, right around 80 to 100 employees. So you have everything in between that are looking uh, at how to save money, and it's impactful uh, at the end of the day. So really what we, we've asked employer groups and brokers is, what are you getting a discount off of? Can anybody tell me? We want to understand what other people pay for the service. This is the only service today that we use where we don't ask questions. We just pull out our ID card, and it's business as usual, and it's an unlimited credit card. As you can see, deductibles and things like that move quite rapidly over to the members, so now they have to do something a little bit different. Where do, you, where do you pass off that cost? Do you stay with what you've been doing or do you move into another direction? So that's why a lot of folks are starting to utilize uh, value-based payments. Some of the fun facts about us, uh, when you do move to value-based payments, uh, we have about a 98% acceptance rate uh, using, I would say, Medicare at 140 is our typical benchmark that we do utilize. Um, so we do see about 2% pushback, and what that means is that when a facility says, hey, listen, Ryan, I'm not willing to take 140% of Medicare. So one of the things that does differentiate us is we are collaborative with the facilities in the sense that we are given a corridor to be able to negotiate with them. Believe it or not, my fastest growing block of business is hospitals. What do you think they do for their own employees? This is what they're doing. So they're very smart when it comes to their own employees, but when it comes to you folks, well, it's a whole other ball game. So it's a buyer's beware market, as we like to say. Uh, I think we cover 48 states right now where we have claims or clients. I think we're now at 50. Uh, I think we just hit Hawaii recently. So it's, uh, it's definitely been a fun ride uh, as we start to see the patterns kind of across the country and what we're seeing. 
So just a little bit of a background for you, uh, and I won't go into too much detail, but value-based payments, what is that for people who don't know what that is? Uh, that is a reimbursement based on either Medicare or cost information for a medical service. So if I go in for an x-ray, what is that gonna cost? What are other people paying for it? Now we have some sort of benchmark uh, to be able to look at that. Now there's definitely different types of uh, value-based payments or Medicare Plus. Uh, you definitely have Medicare factors uh, for out-of-network. A lot of folks do Medicare Plus, 40, 50 for out-of-network. It's pretty standard. Uh, you heard the dialysis folks. We talk about procedure specific. That's one of them where you carve it out and you base that on a Medicare as well. So that's a perfect example. Our fastest growing uh, block of business is what we call our VBP health plan. So what that is, is it's keeping a PPO for the doctors and the physicians and the specialists. And what we are changing is you no longer have a PPO for the facilities. It's open access, go wherever you like. So we, that has changed quite a bit the game of what folks are starting to do because you're increasing the benefits and you're watching those bottom dollars. And one of the things that was funny that I heard someone talk about uh, yesterday was, well, I don't get my data. I can't have access to my data. That was, it was an interesting comment because that's how we've all been trained to do is, well, just trust us. We've got your best interests at hand. So now it's starting to peel back that onion to see what you're paying for. Uh, and it's become very interesting. One of the things with value-based payments, it's a great starting point, but one of the things that we're seeing now is marrying it with quality, so price and quality coming together. Believe it or not, uh, California did a study, the higher the price, the worse the quality. Who do you think those people were? Stanford, Sutter, there's all sorts of offenders out there uh, that people are you know, trained to say, oh, if it's a high price, it must be good quality. So we have those factors that we're marrying together to start now pushing folks to quality providers uh, with good price. But let's kind of jump in to see what it looks like. Uh, as Tom stated, let's see how this actually impacted folks um, versus last year we kind of set the, the playground for you, how it works and what it goes into. But this is an actual group. So this is a self-funded group. Uh, they're located in Tennessee. They were previously with the Blues, about 300 employees. Uh, they've been with us a little over a year now. And when we looked at their claims makeup, 70% uh, of their claims were through facilities. So when we define facilities, that's hospitals, standalone surgery centers, it could be dialysis, substance abuse, uh, you name it. Anything that falls into facility, we're gonna handle. 30% of their claims were physician and ancillary, your everyday providers, your, your PCPs and your specialists. So what they had ended up doing was moving to a Medicare at 140%. So if we go look on that right-hand side, we can see we've processed uh, right around 193 claims. So total bill charges of about 900,000. The plan ended up paying 236,000. So they saved about 676,000 or a 74% discount. And that was based on a Medicare Plus model, 140%. So once again, you can see uh, based on the decrease uh, on that the second bullet point where HST involvement says a 41% decrease in uh, the monthly medical cost per employee per month. It really started to change the game of what folks are starting to do today. And remember, there's stop loss carriers in this room that will absolutely give you a big discount for moving this type of model. Um, so we have several of our preferred carriers that we work with that are here uh, that know how to underwrite this as well because we're gonna impact the claims. That's the, stop, that's the first point but then stop loss needs are reflected in their rates as well on the spec and the ag, and then the admin fees as well, moving from an ASO type model. So you can see some of the impacts here. Now what everybody asked me is, what about that 2%? What about the balanced billing? How did that all look? How did it all work? So we have a patient advocacy center in-house located in Irvine, California. That is our team that handles any kind of member inquiries, any type of balanced billing, or if a provider says, uh, listen, I'm not going to accept your payment. So they're the ones kind of on that front lines making sure that they're, hand, you know, holding the hand of the member during this process because it is a little intimidating. So we're in constant communication with them along with the provider. As you can see with this case, there is currently no open cases. Uh, we did have four cases, uh, but those were all previous before services are rendered. One of the things that we do do that's a little different than most is we'll actually tell the facility on the elective procedures up front hey, by the way, this is a reference-based pricing plan, and here's what the plan's gonna pay. Any questions? So we'll do that up front uh, in those regards. Most of the times we won't hear back from the facilities during that pre-auth process, but sometimes we will hear back 
and they want to understand the pricing. It just helps us mitigate any type of background noise on the back end. But as you can see, not a lot of cases to be had for this. Case study two, we're going to look at a little larger group, about 1,000 employees. Uh, this was, they're located in Texas, spread across all the United States. They are truck drivers, very high maintenance, not the healthiest people by any means. Um, so what we looked at again, uh, they've been with us a little bit over a year as well. Their facility uh, utilization was about 79%, and you could see physicians uh, hovering right around 21%. So one of the things we did is we moved them to the Medicare at 140, and you can see we processed a little over 2,000 claims, and uh, bill charges are about 8.8 .8 million. The plan only paid out 1.8 million uh, of that 8.8. .8. So they had about 7 million in savings, right around an 80% discount. I can tell you for this group, uh, this was very valuable for them, not only for the CFO, but for the HR as well, because what this allowed them to do is they went and purchased another company of the same size based on the money they had saved, and they said this was a direct action. So that was kind of exciting to hear that they were using that money for something else versus just always going into medical expenses. So as you can see, if we look at the fourth quarter, uh, under their previous, they were with the Blues. Under the fourth qu quarter, over the previous three years, they had averaged a PEPM of $532. So the fourth quarter using uh, VBP or value-based payments, it was $190 PEPM. So significant savings for the employer group. Once again, they can use that money to utilize other things going forward. Now if we go and look, let's take a look at the PAC cases that we did see. So currently, and this is live as you see it today, out of those 2,000 claims, we had 32 claims where we did receive balance bills uh, and pushback. So I think that's right around 1.5% of what we're seeing. You know, typically we see our groups at you know, a little, little less than 2%. Uh, once again, our patient advocacy center is there to be able to hold the hands of the members uh, and the providers. Uh, we do have a pretty collaborative approach when dealing with the facilities. Um, we do have a lot of arrangements in the sense that we can do direct agreements uh, or if we need to tailor certain things to go to a certain facility, um, we can do that too as well. Um, I'll give you a little example. One of the largest facilities in Illinois is actually going after employer groups directly using reference-based pricing. So there's a reason uh, that we're moving in that direction. But I'm going to kind of skip forward a little bit. This is just a very high level uh, where you can see build charges versus the Medicare allowable price. This is based on our block of business and what we're seeing. So your Medicare allowable price we'll refer to as MAP. You can see on the map anywhere from one to two times and 12 to 21 times. As you can see, the great state of Nevada, interesting. Seems to be our highest offender. But most times what we see across the country uh, when PPOs have their discounts and things like that, I get asked all the time, well, how does their discount look on a Medicare factor? Typically what we see is two to six times Medicare, depending on where you are in the country. So it just gives you a nice little snapshot of kind of what we're seeing uh, in our marketplace. Average savings by region, you can see kind of what were average uh, savings when you move to a Medicare Plus, uh, averaging about 70% most places. Uh, some states will be a little different. Maryland obviously is a different animal and it, it's got its own fee schedules and things like that. Uh, but as you can see, on average it's about 70%. Top inpatient DRGs, so these are diagnoses when you go inpatient, so think of uh, knee procedures or spinal fusions or things like that. This is what we saw the highest savings were. Uh, we can look at bone disease as the first one. You can see about average charge being 86,000 on our plans uh, at Medicare 140. You can see the allowed amount was 10,000. So average savings is about 88% uh, typically. And it just starts to break down for you some of the things that we were seeing, some of the most highest inflation on what procedures uh, on our book of business. So let's, let's dive in a little more. Let's take that inpatient procedure. Let's look at what everybody has to deal with as a normal delivery. Um, you can see the highest charge is about 43,000. You can see the lowest charge is about 3,200. So averaging about 13,000. So once again, 50% discount off of 43,000 isn't very exciting when you know other people on average are getting 13,000. So once again, you can see the variations uh, between the 5,000 and 15,000. That's where the majority of folks are coming in. And then you've got a few outliers, as you can see, uh, being that 40,000. But once again, if you don't have the tools, you don't know. It's that buyer's beware market that we always talk about. 
So I'm going to skip over this one since we are pressed for a little time. I just want to make sure that you know you you have a good concept of how this all works. Um, this is one of the most impactful slides that we love to show employers, especially uh, CFOs, CEOs, HR folks. You can continue to do what you're doing today, and trend is one of the things that you won't be able to escape. So on a fully insured book of business, uh, one of our TPAs provided us, I think they administer for over 200,000, and we were able to kind of utilize their data. And what they were saying to us is normal trend that we're seeing on a fully insured is about 12%, and then on a self-funded eight, and then moving to value-based payments, you're going to trend with Medicare at one to two. So if we look at that 400,000 and we move out on that green line for being self-funded, by year four, we're at 544,000. That's a 32% increase now you have to go find. So you're either going to pass it on to the employees or you're going to eat it as an employer. Those are your options. So once again, when you move to reference-based pricing, you now start to trend with Medicare and exactly what they do. So now you have something that's budgetable and manageable going forward. And with that, that's all I've got for you. But what you can see here, a lot of folks say, well, I want to see what it looks like if I was to move to this type of model. So to be able to do that, this is what we would do. Uh, we would be able to show you, here's what you do today. Here's where you could be using a Medicare Plus type model. And I appreciate everybody's time, and hopefully I didn't put everybody to sleep. So thank you.